we'll share both. There it is now. We'll share both the recording and the slides from today's presentation to all attendees. So no need to take notes furiously. Um, and then you can also adjust the uh, format that you see our presentation and speakers today by um, doing a little bit of a change in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should see um, a speaker view. So instead of seeing Hollywood squares with lots of talking heads, you can see the presentation and the speaker by selecting um, speaker view in the upper right hand corner there. So before we get rolling on content here, um, any questions or logistical issues for me before we dive in? All right, well, wonderful. If you're looking for the uh, WIPCA's telehealth webinar, um, Telehealth Beyond the Pandemic Patient-Centered Care Community Health Centers, you have found yourself in the right place today. We are really excited to have you join us. I am Rochelle Andre, the Government Relations Specialist from WIPCA. Um, my colleague Molly Jones will be facilitating with me today, as well as four community health centers. The one did have to dip out for a tornado warning, so hopefully we'll be able to get them to rejoin us this afternoon. So you can see what we have planned today. Um, we'll just do a very brief overview of community health centers, just in case you're not familiar with this very unique type of clinic model. And then we'll do again, a brief overview on what is currently happening in the telehealth environment and really tee up the presentations from our speakers today who are the bread and butter of the, the content here. We have four community health centers sharing their perspectives on telehealth and what it looks like for patients and their clinics. We will have a bit of a panel discussion, followed by Q&A from you all in attendance, and then wrap up with some next steps and resources. And pardon me, just one moment. It is allergy season and I can tell. So wonderful, thank you for joining us. And we're just gonna dive in and get started. So what are community health centers, just in case you're not familiar. So there are many community health centers across Wisconsin, also known as federally qualified health centers, which provide primary and preventative services for patients. So that is not only medical care, but dental, behavioral health, substance use disorder treatment and recovery services, connections to social services, referrals, and lots more. And what makes these organizations really unique is that often these services are co-located. Maybe you can see a dentist and a primary care provider in the same clinic, and we really do wrap care around patients. So that is the community health center model. Community health centers are private or public not-for-profits that are located in or serving high need communities based on some federal requirements and are governed by a patient majority board, which really means that patients do help drive the decision-making at community health centers. And they do provide care to all, regardless of their ability to pay or insurance status. So really part of that safety net for patients across the state. And as you'll see today, we'll present a little bit of data. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, community health centers are also required to do a lot of reporting. So we have a lot of wonderful data to share with you. A little bit about community health center patient demographics. Most patients are adults. And then some community health centers also provide care for special populations and have designations to do that, such as veterans or seasonal agricultural workers as a few examples. And then finally, just a little bit more on demographics of patients so you can get a sense of who our presenters will be talking about today. The majority of patients, 78%, earn at or below 200% of the federal poverty level, which in 2019 was about $25,000 for a family of four. So many of our patients are indeed living in poverty. Again, the majority of patients are also Medicaid enrollees. So we do a lot of work on Medicaid policy and serve a lot of Medicaid patients. And then about one out of five are uninsured. We do have health centers located all, pardon me, all across the state of Wisconsin. There are 17 federally qualified health centers here in the state, here seen on the map. And we do serve patients from every single county in Wisconsin, which is very exciting. In uh, 2019, that was over 300,000 patients across the network of community health centers. And of course, if you'd like this map and to find a community health center near you, we are always help you, happy to help you do that. So with that, um, just want to let you know who WIPCA is. So I work with WIPCA. I'm our government relations specialist, so take lead on our external advocacy work. We are the membership association for those 17 nonprofit entities across the state. We provide training and technical assistance and support them in their work to advance care for patients. 
And of course, happy to provide more information about that as well. And now I will turn it on over to today's objectives, just so you know what we're trying to accomplish with you in the next hour or so here until 3.30. First, we wanna highlight a broad range of how telehealth is used, which we call use cases and kind of technical lingo here. And that's across a variety of service lines, such as behavioral health, chronic disease management, and more. We also want to help um, tell the story of the benefits of telehealth, both for patients as well as for providers and clinics. And then finally, let you know what's working well about policies and help understand how to sustain and grow telehealth as a really important tool to increase access to patient care and make sure um, patients can get the care they need. So with that, I will be happy to turn it over to Molly Jones, my colleague at WIPCA. Molly is our Director of Health Information and Quality. Molly, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. And hello, everyone. My name is Molly Jones, as Rochelle mentioned. Um, so I'm going to dive in and talk about the telehealth environment and do some framing before our health centers go ahead and speak. So next slide. The pandemic accelerated the adoption of technology and digital tools in healthcare, transforming the ways healthcare can and is delivered. So under the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic, it became imperative for healthcare providers to develop ways to virtually connect with their patients, spurring an unprecedented adoption of telehealth tools to facilitate care. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're going to start with what is telehealth? And at its core, telehealth is delivering care at a distance. And so this is a really broad term that it can encompass a lot. Telehealth can encompass, you know, a telehealth visit between a patient and provider in real time. Telehealth can um, encompass secure messages exchanged between a patient and provider team through their patient portal. It can include remote patient monitoring devices where someone may be wearing a, a heart monitor that trans, uh, transfers data to the clinical team for monitoring. It can also be interprofessional consultations where uh, perhaps a primary care physician um, consults with a specialty provider on how to, how to um, provide care for that patient. And while many of these things, some more than others, have been recently adopted tools in healthcare, there are some things we've done for telehealth for so long that we don't even think about it as telehealth, right? So for example, radiology. An x-ray is taken at one entity, the image is sent over to a radiologist for the review, and then sent back. That is teleradiology in essence, but we just call it radiology because it's so commonplace. And so while acknowledging that telehealth can encompass an array of tools, today we're gonna to hone in on clinical services and visits provided via telehealth. So we're gonna go ahead and set aside some of the pieces around secure messaging and remote patient monitoring devices, just so this webinar actually lasts for 90 minutes instead of two or three hours. Um, but we're more than happy to talk through anything related to those topics at another time. So don't take this webinar uh, as a reason that we're not talking about it just for time. So we'll move to the next slide. So as we focus our attention on clinical services provided via telehealth, we're gonna talk about telehealth visits. So there's three dimensions of telehealth visits that I wanna draw our attention to and highlight today. The first is who, who receives a telehealth visit and who's all involved, right? So there's the typical kind of telehealth visit that you would think of between a patient and a provider. Um, and this is where you often hear terms like distant and originating sites coming up to describe where the patient is located and where the provider is located. And you'll note that COVID-19 um, really prompted some massive flexibilities um, that had to be made in determining where can a provider be located? Where can a patient be located in order to provide telehealth services? And so we're seeing more and more flexibilities or have seen flexibilities with COVID-19 that have allowed the patient to be in their home and have allowed the provider to be in their home or in clinic or in a setting that is secure and private, um, which has been greatly helpful. Um, telehealth visits can also be between a provider and a provider. And I've already provided that example of an interprofessional consultation and what that can look like. Another dimension of telehealth to consider is how telehealth visits can be provided. So telehealth can be provided in real time or synchronously. So similar to how this webinar is being put on. And this is a typical telehealth visit that I think you would think of. But telehealth can also be provided asynchronously or just not in real time. And that x-ray example we talked about earlier is an example of that. And we'll hear some other examples of how store and forward telehealth models, so asynchronous types of data exchange, can look like in practice. And I think Dr. Riffle will refer to some of that in her uh, dental triaging uh, presentation. And then telehealth visits can also be scheduled visits or on-demand visits. And I think that's relatively obvious for many of us, but I wanted to highlight it because, you know, on-demand telehealth can be a virtual equivalent to a walk-in clinic, 
But on-demand telehealth can also be a key tool that facilitates integrated models of care. Um, so for example, a patient might come into a primary care doc and identify some behavioral health needs. And so maybe in an in-person setting, the doc would you know, facilitate a connection to a behavioral health provider same day, do a warm handoff so that patient can get all their needs met within one visit. That can also happen via telehealth and I think is one of the pros in our on-demand um, opportunities and how we can leverage uh, telehealth visits. Next slide. So now we'll scope into how community health centers have leveraged telehealth. So in the early days of the pandemic, and I think this is a story many of us have heard several times, you know, health centers nimbly shifted their care delivery models to provide virtual care for their patients. Why did they, why did they do this? They did this to keep their patients, communities, and workforce safe in a time of unprecedented um, uncertainty. Um, they also adopted it to provide remote access to, uh, for their patients and to um, establish continuity of care opportunities so they didn't lose contact with their patients um, in March of 2020. Health centers were building the plane as they flew it, setting up audio only visits first and then um, expanding on to support video and audio visits. Um, some health centers did this over the weekend, overnight. Um, this was really us watching in real time uh, a safety net being built uh, before us to ensure that patients who needed to be seen could get the care they needed. Next slide. And as you can see here in 2020, community health centers provided almost 70 times the number of visits virtually or via telehealth in 2020 than they did in 2019. Telehealth was undoubtedly a very in essential tool uh, to support healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. And throughout our learning over the past year and a half, we've also seen the many ways that telehealth has been an essential tool outside of the context of a global pandemic as well. Next slide. My last two slides I want to talk through, we'll go to the previous slide. What have we learned um, and where are we going with telehealth? So the first thing we've learned is that telehealth is a clinical tool in our toolkit. It is not a new service line. It doesn't replace in-person visits. Telehealth doesn't even change the types of care community health centers can provide. It has transformed how we can deliver care by creating another tool in our toolkit in how, and creating options for how patients can access care. So as I said, telehealth doesn't uh, replace an in-person visit. If I break my arm and I need to go and get a cast uh, set, I will still need to go into the clinic. But there are plenty of opportunities where telehealth can be a clinically appropriate method uh, for delivering care. Another thing, we didn't learn this, we knew this all along, that providing the best care to patients means providing care at the correct time, at the correct place, and delivered in the most effective ways. And I think one thing we've learned is that telehealth is one of the, um, provides us flexibilities in how and when we can provide care and um, when we can provide care. And today you'll hear more from community health centers on the ways they're leveraging telehealth to make uh, care more accessible to their patients. And finally, um, telehealth has, uh, has also created additional ways for patients to access care who may not have otherwise been able to access care. Um, mitigating some of the barriers that some patients face to in-person care, like transportation, childcare, work schedules, et cetera, have all been key uh, successes that we've found in the use of telehealth. Um, and by creating virtual access points, we don't rely on a patient to always come to us. Telehealth is a way for us to truly meet a patient where they're at, and we can finally come to them. Um, and so we've seen reduced no-show rates across the board for telehealth visits versus in-person visits. And I think it's important to note here that telephone-only visits or audio-only visits, as they've been called, um, have been an essential tool to also mitigating some of the barriers that arise when thinking about video visits, right? Um, if you don't have access to broadband or you have connectivity issues, you don't have access to the right technologies or aren't sure how to use them, um, phone has been a key part. So given all that we've learned over the past year, Wisconsin Community Health Centers are working to develop hybrid models of care delivery that bring together the best of telehealth and the best of in-person to serve our patients. We're asking ourselves questions like, how can we leverage these new tools uh, to meet the needs of our patients and communities so they can reach their highest health potential? And that's something we're excited to be uh, working on. Next slide. The ways in which, uh, healthcare providers can leverage telehealth relies heavily on telehealth policy. The policy landscape surrounding telehealth is rapidly transforming. Uh, during the public health emergency declaration, there have been a lot of flexibilities offered in how telehealth can be provided. For example, Wisconsin Medicaid, um, during the uh, public health emergency early on, 
made it available that any covered service by Medicaid that can be delivered via telehealth in a functionally equivalent way to in-person would be a covered service. Um, these flexibilities have been essential, enabling healthcare providers to maintain con continuity of care with their patients during a global pandemic. Um, and now we're starting to see telehealth the telehealth policy environment starting to shift from a temporary policies to a more permanent policy is covering Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial payers. And we, um, you know, the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association and community health centers are tracking these policy developments, and we're eager to share what's working well and what we're learning, especially with partners like you all who are on the line today. Um, we'd like for community health center voices to be in the mix and informing and shaping the types of permanent policy that will be most beneficial to our patients and our communities. Next slide. And with that framing, we're going to move on to the meat and the exciting part of the webinar, which is that we are thrilled to have four health centers from across Wisconsin share their insights and perspectives from on the ground um, in their day to day work with you today. Um, we have an incredible panel um, from 16th Street Community Health Centers in the Milwaukee and Waukesha area um, from Family Health Center of Marshfield serving central and northern Wisconsin. We have folks on the line from Scenic Bluffs who are in a tornado warning emergency and who have stepped away, but hopefully they'll come back to share more about school-based behavioral health care that they're doing via telehealth. And we also have someone on the line from Community Health Systems in the Beloit area. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presentation with Dr. Pine and Dr. Valentine at 16th Street, who are going to share their insights on leveraging telehealth to support patients with chronic care. Dr. Pine and Valentine, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brett Valentine, and I'm joined by Dr. Pine. We're both family doctors um, and serve as roles as medical directors here at the 16th Street um, Community Health Centers here in Milwaukee. You can go to the next slide. Uh, just a little bit about our, our uh, organization. We are located on the south side of Mo Milwaukee predominantly. We have four full service clinics. Um, in the Milwaukee area, as well as providing a number of other services to the, to our community, working in a community health center, geriatric services, um, behavioral health, AODA services, comprehensive community care services, WIC. Um, we do a lot of uh, a wide variety of things, social services for our patients. And then we have a satellite location in Waukesha as well. Next slide. A little bit about our population. We serve a, um, ECNAM, a diverse population that is predominantly Hispanic um, in ethnicity and ethnicity and predominantly low income, similar to, the, um, similar to the other patients at the community health centers here today. All right, next slide. So um, Dr. Valentine and I will demonstrate how we've been using telehealth in very specific cases. We won't delve too far into the medical side of things, just how we are using telehealth um, to overcome some of the barriers that we've historically seen with our patients. So um, one patient that I have been seeing for quite a while, um, and of course through the last year is a 72 year old female, many chronic conditions, too many to list on this slide, but including heart failure high, and high blood pressure. Um, she is definitely very motivated like many patients by symptoms that she has. So she'll come in for headaches and really focus on taking medications related to that, um, but had historically let her other chronic conditions fall through the cracks if it wasn't causing immediate symptoms for her. So this really um, led to a lot of issues. Um, and in 2019 alone, she had three hospitalizations um, that were related to uncontrolled chronic conditions. Conditions. Um, some of the other barriers um, that she had uh, in getting to clinic visits themselves uh, were a lot of pain issues. Uh, she actually is needing a knee replacement, um, so it's very difficult for her to walk because of arthritis she has. Um, she's had falls in the past. Um, so, of course, we want to be very careful of that and limit uh, risk to her in, in leaving the house. She also had been having some decline in her memory in the past couple of years, and so it was harder for her to remember her medications, which was also causing an issue. And lastly, outside of um, uh, specific medical conditions, uh, she was not bringing her med medications to visits. So it was hard to know what she was being prescribed at um, specialist visits. It was hard to know if she was actually picking up the right medications from the pharmacy. And a lot of times her family members would just drop her off for her visits. 
And so she would just be seen alone or um, a random, or not a random person, but a different person each time would come. And so there wasn't one person that knew her medical history or what she should be doing when she left um, our clinic visits. And so there wasn't really much support when she left the clinic um, to take care of her chronic conditions. So this led to a lot of issues, um, which actually we were able to address a lot more closely in the last year. So next slide. Um, so through telehealth, um, you know, previously I wouldn't have thought about using that in, in the last year where we were forced to do it because of the pandemic, we actually were able to see a lot of benefits um, that really we would like to see move forward um, to use, uh, to leverage um, our patient visits uh, to the most efficient and beneficial ways to our patients. So some specific things that we saw um, with this patient was that uh, it was a lot easier for her. It took a lot out of her to get in and out of the house. And so um, we would hear from patients that have this trouble that then they would really be down for a day or two, very difficult to move around the house. And so um, it wasn't adding that extra stress to her each time she needed to be seen, not just at our clinic, but she was seeing specialists as well. Um, and of course, with her age and chronic conditions, uh, she was at a high risk for communicable diseases, including COVID. And so it was great to lower that risk by limiting the amount of time she was actually in the clinic. Um, and then with her care itself, um, we had been repeating the same information every visit, really trying to get to the bottom of her medications. And so it just felt like Groundhog's Day that we were doing the same visit over and over and over again and really not getting anywhere. So we're actually able to progress her care. Um, and she was more consistent with her visits, um, both with myself and with her specialists. And she was starting to take her medications as directed at home. And um, a lot of that came from her family members. She does live with um, her son and daughter-in-law and some grandchildren. And her daughter-in-law and a granddaughter um, have become essentially her personal care workers. Um, and they really became very knowledgeable about her medical conditions, her medications. Um, her follow-up visits and were able to check in every day, check her blood pressure, check her blood sugar, um, and really be able to communicate that back as in addition to being able to provide the care on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another very interesting thing uh, that we've seen is just looking at the home environment gives us a lot of clues as to what is going on. Um, you know, we've had numerous visits where patients have had um, uh, their smoke detectors beeping. <laughs> um, and so that led to a lot of conversations about, you know, replacing those batteries, just looking at um, fall risks in the house. Um, and just talking with multiple family members gives a lot of insight. And I already mentioned um, some of the medications. Uh, it's very helpful to know exactly what medications patients are taking. And um, I would say usually in the clinic, maybe one in 10 patients will bring their medications. And so if they're already at home, it's easier for them to, to go grab those and go through them one by one. So um, through all of this, she didn't have any hospitalizations in the last year which was, you know, really a feat. And um, now we're seeing, now we're continuing telehealth, but of course seeing her in person, we'll go through that a little bit more closely, what, um, how we determine whether we do things in person or, or virtually. Um, but with this particular patient, about every third visit is in person. And then we have um, two virtual visits, roughly. Of course, if there's something more acute going on, we make those changes. Um, but, but we really saw a lot of great things with this patient. So next slide. I'll be talking about um, a case of a 35 year old male that established um, at our clinic for primary care. Um, he deals with chronic conditions, health conditions of opiate use disorder, hepatitis C, depression and anxiety. Um, we tend to address acute care needs uh, regularly during part of his routine care. Um, for his opiate use disorder, he's in medication assisted treatment. Um, and so what that requires um, in our clinic is that they have frequent visits, particularly early on in treatment, um, 
weekly, bi-weekly for the first few months, and then um, monthly once people have stabilized, but still if they're, they're coming to clinic or being in contact with us very frequently for their care. Um, this patient is also, um, also established with one of our behavioral health providers, a dual diagnosis therapist who does both substance use disorder treatment and treatment for depression and anxiety here at our clinic as well. A little bit about uh, this patient to give some context. Um, so this young man is, is transiently homeless is sort of maybe the easiest way to say it, where he's living in between shelters, living in other person's houses. Sometimes his like living situation changes on a week to week or a month to month basis. And it's not always co-located right next to our um, community health center. Um, he's only using public transportation. He doesn't have a vehicle. So getting to our clinic can be burdensome in certain scenarios, certain days. Um, last thing, he's trying to get on his feet, you know, so he's working. He does a variety of laborers work um, and it sort of varies. But generally in, in these roles and these jobs, there's not a lot of, you know, sick time for him to come to medical appointments um, or these are like cash jobs or things where like you don't actually have time off to go sort of uh, go to the doctor to do that. So prioritizing work is really important um, in a lot of these settings. And then his technology is variable. You know, sometimes you have a phone that he's paying by the minute. Sometimes he'll be using someone's iPhone where you can do a video visit um, if we're doing a telehealth appointment. So um, the technology isn't always consistent. So you can go to the next slide. So using sort of a hybrid model where we're seeing him in person, but we're also allowing some telehealth appointments, it's a lot of number of things to help improve his care. I think the most important thing for patients that need a lot of uh, appointments need follow-ups frequently um, is that it really improves adherence to treatment. And this is particularly true for treating a chronic disease such as opiate use disorder, where he's being seen every week or every other week uh, for a period of time when it's really hard for him, you know, he has all these barriers that make it hard for him to get to clinic. So in decreasing those barriers and improving his, his ability to be in clinic to contact us, both myself and our behavior health, you know, his therapists, uh, allows for uninterrupted care and sort of consistency um, and improves his outcomes. You know, maintaining consistent contacts helps us grow this therapeutic relationship um, sort of in all settings. Um, really, it's an improvement in the patient experience as well, right? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to meet them where they are. We're trying to accommodate for his work schedule, accommodate for the way he's, um, like where he's living, his technology. So some appointments will be, um, audio only just based on the technology um, that's available to him. I think in general, like telehealth is also a contemporary way to provide medical care, right? So this is people, as we're moving forward into the, you know, the 21st century, you know, we're meeting people in a way that they communicate regularly, right? FaceTime is like a general way that a lot of people are communicating within their families, um, you know, using phone or using technology appropriately to provide care is consistent with what our society is doing across all other boards of communication. So it seems um, contemporary to sort of provide care in this way too, and patients really like that. Uh, I'll say that generally telehealth has allowed us, allowed patients to maintain care and maintain access to care, even if their lives take them slightly outside of their general living area. If they're not like co-located right next to us, and they're you know they're having they're moving in different neighborhoods or further away, or things are hard to come in. Um, it's increasing access, allowing them to. I think it also expands sort of our, our net and our ability to reach out to other patients and say, oh, maybe it is possible to, me, to maintain care if I have the ability to do some telehealth care um, as part of my general medical care. Um, I'll say for this patient particularly, once he was established um, like on a regular regimen for opiate use disorder, his depression and anxiety, his utilization of the hospital decreased significantly. I think this is maybe a general statement for all of good primary care is that preventive care and access to care help prevent sort of the major acute events that require use or overuse of our hospital systems. Um, or people, if they aren't established with someone, they'll tend to go to the ER for all sort of minor complaints. When, when he's seeing us in real time, I can address some of his acute needs, both in person and via telehealth. I think the last benefit to telehealth uh, that we've seen is that it's helped to decrease some of the burnout amongst the providers that are taking care of our patients, right? Because telehealth has allowed us to change some workflows to help decrease some of the work that we're doing after work, right? So previous times when we'd want patients to come back to follow up on certain, certain health conditions or results and to sort of talk through that, um, it, patients always can't come in to sort of do that. So it's one thing that you're always sort of doing at the end of the day, you're calling patients, but by incorporating telehealth, that's allowed our workflows to 
sort of decrease some of that workload and bring it back to sort of the normal day-to-day -day practice. Because some of these visits, when we're following up and reviewing this stuff in detail with patients, isn't quite taking the time at the margins at the end of the day because of that, because of our able to coordinate care. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, I think that there, there is a, a bit of a perception um, that uh, the telehealth, the, you know, there's a, a push to have telehealth replace in-person visits. And so uh, we're really not doing that. And especially, um, you know, as we've gotten some things more under control with our, you know, protocols in, in regard to COVID-19, um, you know, we're, we're really open to seeing all patients in clinic and, and that definitely is our priority. Um, but you know where we, we see telehealth um, being used is truly as a hybrid model. And so uh, we just wanted to lay out um, generally how we decide to see a patient in person or telehealth and you know our, our thought approach to that. So generally um, if a patient is calling the clinic we do have a, a, a recommendation um, for our call center that if it's a diabetes or high blood pressure follow-up we really try to get those as in-person visits um, we do allow a patient to um, say if they want to be seen in person or virtual for most every other visit though of course, not physical exams or well child checks, those also need to be in person. Um, about, I would say over 80%, um, I would say probably closer to 90% of our visits right now are in person. So it is um, still a bit small, but it is very helpful for, um, for you know, when that is an appropriate use of, of the virtual visits. If a patient has already seen the provider and the provider is deciding what to do with the next visit, they're really guiding what that visit should look like. If it should be in person or virtual, um, and they're considering if that if they'll need a physical exam then or you know need to see something truly in person the next visit. Um, if they are uh, monitoring medical conditions in some way at home um, that can just be shared uh, verbally as opposed to needing a true uh, measurement in in the lab or in the lab or in our clinic. Um, if there is a virtual a visit done, of course, video is preferable. And our, our medical assistants really work to troubleshoot um, issues. Uh, this patient that I had talked about specifically, uh, her granddaughter has, um, has a video component to her phone and sets up this patient um, for every vi virtual visit. So we are able to do that by video. Of course, that doesn't work in every situation. So we do allow video or audio for um, appointments where that video doesn't happen. Virtual visits, like I said, are happening in conjunction with in-person visits. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really determined what is needed at each visit. Um, if somebody is being seen virtually, uh, sometimes they're at work and can't come in on a break in, in, at work, but could stop in after work and do their labs. Um, we're scheduling those lab appointments later, um, but generally being done the same day. Um, we are looking at preventative issues every visit, even if it's virtual. And so we'll generate the mammogram order and then mail it to the patient. Um, and, and doing things like that. So we're really treating it all um, as a complete visit each time. And then if we are in the middle of a telehealth visit and something needs to be seen, there's a rash or truly need a, a you know, a, a urine uh, analysis done at that visit, um, we have the patient come in at that point. So we do um, convert visits in that way. Um, it's not two discrete visits. Um, we really try to do that on the same day. So um, the way this looks is a mix of in-person and virtual visits um, for all of our patients to best fit their life and the type of care that they need. So um, it looks a little bit different for each, each patient and that's what we wanna see is to have this really personalized for everyone. That's it for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Pine and Dr. Valentine. Really appreciate that content. And now we'll turn it over to Sheila Weeks from Family Health Center of Marshfield to talk about the ways that they have leveraged telehealth uh, to support their substance use disorder uh, services. Thank over you, Molly. You, 
Yes, thank you. Um, as noted, I'm going to speak to uh, Family Health Center Substance Use Disorder Services. Um, I would note Family Health Center of Marshfield Incorporated, as a member of the Marshfield Clinic Health System, we also provide a large number of dental services and other services, but I'm just going to focus on the substance use disorder work at this point. So the next slide, please. So with that said, um, I want to talk to you about where we provide those services. Um, we do some things that are very similar to the 16th Street Clinic and the providers who spoke, but we're doing it in an entirely different environment. So depending on your familiarity with Wisconsin, think of us as being north of 10. And really, if from Highway 10, you just head right straight up to the UP, we serve counties and people throughout those areas. Um, we don't necessarily have so many people from Wassa because as soon as you get to a more urban area, uh, there's more resources. We tend to serve all that in between space where there doesn't tend to be a lot of resources. So it's a rural service delivery uh, system. Minocqua is where we began and that was part of the HOPE uh, grants that went out. So November of 2016, we opened there. And that is part of a consortium with 10 partner agencies in five counties and three tribal communities. Uh, the way that fits together as a consortium, we are the MAT provider in that region, along with providing counseling, but many times what we're doing is we're one piece of the team that is serving a particular patient. So someone may well be getting their counseling, say, from Family Resource Center, which is out at Lacta Flambeau, but they may be getting their medication-assisted treatment from us. So if you think about that, people may be having to travel quite a bit to go to all of their appointments. Um, we also opened in Marshfield in August of 2018. Again, you're looking, while Marshfield certainly has some resources, it's not really very large. And we serve people from the small communities, Arpen, Auburndale, Spencer, places like that. So again, you're talking another rural environment. Uh, Lady Smith, we opened in February of 2019. Um, that was a HOPE II grant, and that is co-located with Indian Head Community Action Agency up in the Ladysmith area. So when you look at the three clinics, um, there are in fact two hours between each one of them, almost as if we had planned it. We didn't, but it is a solid two hours. And that has impact when you're talking small clinics and shared providers, because if you've tried to hire a psychiatrist lately, there is no way in this world that A, I could find three psychiatrists or B, I could afford three psychiatrists. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, there are multiple elements to rural delivery. So I showed you the, the distance of the two uh, hours, but then these are what the roads actually look like there at the bottom of the picture. Actually, depending on the year, that can be much of uh, nine months that there's various aspects of that. Because yes, we have had snow and ice in May and we've had it in October. So yeah, a lot of it looks like that. And then there's the roads themselves, the pop out on your right, the lines that are black, that's the only part that's four lane everything else is two lane. So there's nothing fast about traveling in person from one site to the next. So the next slide, please. So what happens is we are able to access telehealth and this has been an amazing thing. And while it seems like you'd start with the patients, actually you can't serve any patients if you don't have providers. So I'm gonna start with the providers. And I think that many people are aware of the workforce issues trying to find and hire qualified people that are really passionate about this service. So what we are able to do via telehealth is we function as a group practice across all three sites. So I have one psychiatrist, and then I have an, uh, several uh, DNPs who are uh, the primary prescribers for our medication-assisted treatment. Likewise, I have a couple of therapists, um, several counselors, and they all function across all three sites. What that means is depending on where they're based, they see some people in person, but then they also do clinic-to-clinic -clinic telehealth, and they do clinic to wherever the person's located, telephone at this point. We'll talk a little more about that. But what this does is if a pregnant patient calls us, oh, say at noon by noon today, uh, she could be seen today and services delivered at one of the clinics because we do see people for inductions in person, but we figure out a way to do that within the services that we have. So again, this group function is huge. And as we've gone through the summer and people can actually have vacations, that really helps with preventing burnout. Without the group practice, we could not do that. Then as we work with folks who are coming along in their recovery and they're at that great spot where they get a job, 
um, as was noted with the providers from 16th Street, the substance use disorder up front, we're seeing them twice a week and then once a week, but we're seeing them very frequently. Well, as they're getting better and they get jobs, they're not in a position to travel to have all of these appointments. Because again, by that time, they're probably down to less frequent because their recovery is progressing. But still, depending on where they're working, there's almost no businesses right next to our clinics. Most of them would have to travel a distance. So we do have people who take their telehealth appointments on their break or to cross their lunch hour. So there's much greater flexibility in scheduling. In some cases, it's simply a matter of being able to take it right after their shift without having to drive the 45 minutes or an hour one way to get to the appointment. Another huge area for barriers that we have found is for people with children. If that adult needs substance use disorder services, whether it's a mom, a dad, a caregiver, because we do have children who are being cared for by other uh, kinship, um, that has been a huge issue. Children, there, there's almost no daycare up there. There's no drop-in daycare. We have had really, um, what should we say, really focused, motivated moms come with their five children to their appointment, and it is the best they can do. They're showing up for it, but here you've got five underage children. That's just not super conducive to the appointment that you need, but what else can she do? It would not be appropriate to leave the kids at home, so she brought them. Well, if instead we can reach into the home at this point with a telephone call, and again, we would like to go to more of the uh, video as well. But if we can reach in, there's all the at-home things that the kids usually do. She can get more privacy and time away in the home with the children present than coming into the clinic. Weather barriers, I already showed you the snow. Well, there's also the tornado barriers. Um, if people don't have to travel when we're having storms, uh, we can do a better job of delivering services. And that applies to patients and providers. Uh, we're at a point where um, we do have providers who are able to work from home there's a snowstorm coming, we just have them plan to be at home and they reach out to their patients via tele and there's no interruption in services. And then there was the pandemic response, the beginning and then the continued. Because of the emergency approval of telephone, in 24 hours from the uh, March 12th lockdown, within 24 hours, we had all of our appointments switched to telephone. We simply put a team on it. We had absolutely no interruption in services. Now we couldn't do groups, so that stopped but there was never a time where we couldn't have appointments for people and we couldn't continue to provide access and intake. So with the pandemic and now with the Delta variant, um, we had been ramping up our inpatient and really kind of pressuring down our, our telephone because there are people who like telephone and it's not because they're doing really well. We recognize the value of the in-person in one way or another, whether it's coming in person to the clinic for a telehealth clinic appointment where they're seeing other staff and we can get a urine and things like that, or the in-person because the provider's there. We recognize the value of it. And again, to what the provider said from 16th Street, there's a hybrid model here that works. But as the Delta variant risk of transmission increases, we are very much moving back to more telehealth. What makes sense, not only for the individual patient, but for the safety of the full population. So the next slide, please. So the barriers, um, kind of touched on this already, but it's certainly as the other provider said, telehealth, telehealth alone is not enough. We would never want that. The in-person contact with the st staff and providers has value. We believe, as we watched, because we certainly had the lab opportunity to watch this from March of 2019 through, or 2020 rather, through the current date, um, we felt that the people who enrolled in treatment and only had primarily telephone, because that's what we can do, um, did not connect as, oops, did not connect as well as people who had that in person. So some of the things that we built in is that when a person is um, approved to enter treatment, they come in and have an in person contact for all of their consents and things instead of trying to do those via tele. So we begin to build those relationships. We think that's really important. Um, we also think, we don't have research for it, but we believe this, and we've observed it, that the value of telehealth access may vary with the patient needs. So early in treatment, more in person. As the person is stronger in the recovery and they build more recovery capital, then less frequent and more tele makes more sense. And again, we talked about jobs and those kinds of things. So it's the person fulfilling their life roles and, and doing those other things, all of which support their recovery. Um, we do know, and this has been identified, telehealth requires adequate inter serv internet service. That's the largest barrier in the, barrier in the areas where we work. 
Um, I myself live within 15 miles of Wassa, and I have internet challenges that oftentimes I can't have both video and audio. Um, when you get further north into the, the less populated areas, it's even more of an issue. So as um, things are being looked at for infrastructure to support internet service, that's a key, key issue. Um, the other piece of it is that many of the people who are most impacted by social determinants of health have the least amount of access to adequate internet. It is just a given, whether it is due to where they're living, uh, the ability to pay for the internet access, the uh, what they need for um, phones and things in order to be able to access, but again, the least amount of access. And while the telephone serves a purpose and a need, it does not deliver on the visual connection for many people. I appreciated the provider who mentioned um, that the granddaughter had assisted one of the patients. We do find those sorts of things is that when we're uh, wanting to aim for more of the audio and video, there may be other resources that need to be used. So the best case scenario from our point of view for delivering these services and delivering them where we do is that the full array of, ser full array of services to select from based on the patient needs and preferences would be available. So that does mean in-person telehealth, telehealth and telephone. Um, when all three are available, we can then meet the need and there's never an interruption in services. So next slide, please. Thanks so much, Sheila. I really appreciate um, everything you shared. We're going to turn it over um, to the tornado, um, to our folks who are experiencing a tornado. So um, uh, at Scenic Bluffs. So Amy and um, Melina, over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Amy Shanoff. I work for Scenic Bluffs Health Center. You guys can go ahead to the next slide. Melina and I are going to share a little bit about how we're using telehealth to serve students in schools, specifically with behavioral health services just to place the health center geographically for all of you we're on the western side of the state mainly serving a rural area Monroe, lacrosse vernon crawford and grant counties um, we have roughly 7,000 patients 75 percent qualify for our sliding fee scale 20 percent are uninsured and almost half are on badger care um, 10 percent of our patients are best served in another language and if you go to the next slide we've kind of given you a map um, the dots are the schools that we're serving with behavioral health services. Uh, currently, we have seven school districts in the area that we're serving. Um, in the list, you can see um, Arcadia, which is our furthest north. We have a telehealth unit in. Um, it goes all the way down to the south, which is the Kickapoo School District, also has a telehealth unit. There's about a 90-mile um, drive between those two farthest points. Um, the closest schools to us, Cash and West Van Roca, we're still doing in-person services. And then the other four schools, we have telehealth units in. Go to the next slide. Um, just to give you an idea about our school-based behavioral health services, we have two providers that will travel to the schools or provide the services through telehealth. In last school year, we served about 63 students um, by having conversations with their families, learning more about the service. At the end of the school year, we had served 51 students with services. Um, most of the kids are over the age of nine. Uh, we do consider younger students, but it is kind of based on the, the students' uh, personality and abilities. Of the students we're serving, 75% of them qualify for Badger Care. Um, and the, the way we get students into the services is either from a referral from the school or it's someone we're already seeing here at the health center who we recognize as being in one of the schools we serve. And then the providers uh, will make those arrangements. Um, and go ahead, go to the next slide. And the reason this is valuable is if you think about rural areas and it's been stated before, um, often during a day, the parent guardian, the student, and the healthcare provider are in completely different communities. And if you can imagine for a family to leave work, go pick up a student, go to services in another community, drive back to get their student back to school, and then drive back to another community to get to work, that's a full day and something's not happening. The parent's not completing a day of work. The kid's really not in school that day. Um, and that's a lot of burden on a family. Um, most of the schools we talk to, um, without us coming into the school, the kid's generally gonna miss the entire day of school if they have an appointment. Um, we've kind of created a visual here for you. You can kind of see with the student at the center, the benefits that we're seeing for ourselves as a provider, for the school and for the family. And when all those things are working together well, the student's getting the best service they can get. Um, and so you can see from the family minimum scheduling impact when that student um, only has to be present for a 50 minute appointment at school and goes right back to class. Um, they have access to our sliding fee scale through this. Um, they have access to all of our patient supports. 
Um, and they also have the ability to transition, especially in the last school year with schools going virtual, in person, students quarantining. Um, we also are able to do telehealth with people's um, home systems if they, if they have internet and all of that. And so being used to telehealth at school, being able to transition when they're at home, um, it really provided some ongoing support for students who probably would have had breaks in care during that time. Um, what we see with our relationship with the school is um, the school sincerely appreciates the increased access to supports for families. They're the ones recognizing needs. And I think I sometimes feel a sense of relief from the school when they know they have a, set, a place to go to to make sure those family gets the supports it needs. Um, again, minimum loss of education time that child is staying in the school during the day, just missing 50 minutes for their appointment rather than the entire day. Um, the school has interaction with us as a healthcare provider. And again, it's meeting a need that the school's recognized. I'm going to go ahead and let Melina talk about from her perspective as a provider, the benefits. Um, yeah, just pretty much touching base and expanding upon everything that Amy said. Um, working as a counselor at the schools and also providing telehealth services, I am able to counsel students while I'm located in Cashton and I have um, students that are in Arcadia and they are showing up on the telehealth unit and especially with our middle school, high school kids, it's really easy to work with them. Technology to them is just you know, easy to access. They understand it easily and it's nothing to them. And they are growing up in this world where everything is, um, virtual on their phones and that interaction to them is not as strange as it was for us as providers to start, you know, getting used to this new technology when it first was kind of thrown on us with COVID. Um, but it has been a very successful transition. And also I am able to um, meet with a parent for, a, I do a lot of parent only meetings and sessions and I'm able to meet with a parent, as we said before, um, on a lunch hour while they're at work. And in our area, a lot of parents are working in lacrosse, which is a 45 minute drive away. And then I'm meeting with their kid at school. And it's really nice because I they can get all the services they need. Their um, goals, our treatment goals can be met a lot sooner than if they were just being seen at the clinic or us going to the school. We actually can um, communicate with the school staff, school counselors, parents, and also be working directly with the students and everything, everybody can be on the same page at a lot quicker pace than waiting weeks in between the appointments for them to be able to get their kid to an appointment to take off work and build up vacation time and find the right day. Um, and I've just seen a lot of success with this format. It Once again, I, it is not just strictly only telehealth, it is, a combination. I'm seeing them physically. If that student needs a week where, you know what, we need to be seen in person or they're at the clinic for another appointment. Yeah, we can get you an in person, but then we also can work on seeing them um, virtually when I'm at school. There's some students I have seen all three methods physically in school. I've seen them, you know, virtually and also um, at the clinic. So it really is something that if it works out best for them and their schedules where we're at, but they're getting consistent care and we're getting improved outcome as well. Back to you, Amy. You can go ahead and change the slide then. Um, so just a couple outcomes and lessons we've learned from this. Um, it really was an essential, essential asset last year during the pandemic. I think the school sincerely appreciated when we were keeping people out of the building when they wanted to minimize that. Um, again, it was an easy transition because families were doing things at home hybrid. They were doing things in school. It wasn't as difficult as you might have expected. Um, <clears throat> being able to provide behavioral health during the school day is for a lot of families, a huge reduction in stress. Um, even when we call to get appointments made, you can kind of tell as you talk the family through how much simpler this is gonna be than they're expecting. Um, just this sort of relief, like I know my child needs this, I can't fathom how I'm gonna get them to these appointments. And you sort of have taken that, that burden off of them. Um, it's really strengthened our relationships with schools. Again, 
counselors and teachers and school staff are all recognizing the needs of these kids and to be able to meet that need easily by giving us a call um, is a huge asset and it really helps with those communications. Um, we're valuable to our community, they're valuable to their community. We're all trying to meet these big needs and it, it really makes a very strong partnership. Um, we also find that schools are incredibly flexible when we call and they say, oh, you know, this is when the student's appointment is and that's recess and this is a, a 10 year old and it's really important that they get that time outside and we're able to move those appointments around and meet their needs. Um, it's really valuable to have the flexibility of the telehealth unit. Um, and the thing is, it gives us flexibility too. We have some families where we're seeing multiple children from that family. And sometimes it's a benefit to have different providers for the different kids. And if yes. we were driving to the school, we would not, we would not be able to accommodate that. Here? But with the telehealth unit, we can have any of the providers seeing any of the kids. Um, it also for us, because it's rural and there's a lot of driving, when our providers are in their cars driving, that is time that we're paying the provider and we're not seeing anybody. So one, we're not getting reimbursed for the time. And two, that's access that's not happening for somebody. Um, as a community health center, it's important to us to be able to be available to as many people in our community as possible. And a provider in a car is not providing an appointment to a person. So um, those are some of the benefits we've seen. If you wanna go to the next slide. This is just a picture of one of the rooms. We didn't, of course, put people in it, um, but that's one of the units. You can see how clear the screen is. It looks like a behavioral health counseling room um, at a school, and then that's how the student engages with the provider. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let Melina talk a little bit more about examples of some of the kids she's worked with. Okay, just making sure I'm unmuted. Um, I would have to say that um, I kind of was saying before how there are days where I will be talking with the parent and we will be having a virtual meeting while the parents at work. And then we have our kiddos that are located at a school in Arcadia and I'm able to speak with them. Um, we've also transitioned to doing intake sessions as well um, via the telehealth unit here. So that is another route that we're going and being able to start care from the very first day they're actually at the school where they're comfortable. And sometimes it can be intimidating for families when they're new to um, counseling and new to the behavioral health, never um, have used behavioral health services. It's less intimidating when it is coming from people at the school, people that they're comfortable with and also going to a place that they are comfortable going every day. And I think the access to care through the school, through this telehealth unit, is uh, much easier for families as well and actually is easier for access not just for driving but just that intimidation um, area as well next slide I, th I think that's our last slide the only next thing we wanted to make sure is that it's really important to our students that um, insurances continue to reimburse for telehealth um, we're starting to see concerns about that. And um, it's the, lots of kids with lots of different insurances. Right now, Badger Care is continuing to cover it, but some of the um, commercial payers are starting to talk about perhaps not. And that would make it very hard to um, maintain some of these services for kids who are on some of these commercial plans. Just what a worry of ours. Thanks so much, Amy and Melina. Really appreciate that presentation. And now we're going to turn it over to our last presentation of the day with Dr. Cindy Riffle from Community Health Systems to talk more about teledentistry. Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Yes, I, I'm Dr. Cindy Riffle. I'm a general dentist and the uh, quality assurance dentist uh, for Community Health Systems. Uh, the actual name of our clinic is the Beloit Area Community Health Center. And I'm here today to talk about how we can utilize telehealth for dental urgent care triage visits. Uh, we started using uh, virtual visits as they're called early in the pandemic when the uh, Centers for Disease Control and American Dental Association mandated that dental offices could only see emergency patients. Uh, at that time, there was a shortage of PPE and it was uh, desperately needed in the hospitals uh, to care for the COVID patients. So uh, for a good couple of months, we were only permitted to, uh, to see and treat uh, dental emergencies. So next slide. Uh, here is a map of our service area. Our clinic is located in South Central Wisconsin near the state line. Our patients come from Beloit and some of the neighboring cities, but also we draw uh, from some more uh, distant rural communities. 
Uh, next slide. Here's the number of dental patients that were seen over the last uh, two years. These are not individual visits. These are uh, the actual number of patients. You can see that there was a decrease in our number of our patients in 2020. Uh, that was primarily due to um, our, the closing down of our outreach uh, uh, clinics such as Sela Smile, WIC, and Head Start. Uh, so you'll see that there's a lower number from 2020. Okay, next slide. So what does a teledentistry triage appointment actually look like? Um, they look very similar to in-clinic uh, examinations, except of course they're provided virtually. Uh, as with all appointments, we start with a very thorough health history, get a list of the medications the patient is taking, we go through all their allergies, we get a good dental history, and we have a discussion about their chief complaint and what is causing their pain, where is their pain located. And we go through a lot of questions about their symptoms, what, what makes the tooth hurt, and from that information, we already can start developing our diagnosis of what is going on with this particular patient it's by having uh, an in-depth conversation with them. Now then we also can do a visual exam and this is that synchronous type of appointment that Molly talked about earlier, utilizing their cell phone, a tablet or uh, their laptop computer. Uh, we can actually look in their mouth uh, and see what's going on. Do we see swelling? Do we see a big hole in the tooth? Is it just a little chip that they're worried about? Um, is the swelling just very slight or is it very diffuse? We can see a lot of these things and that will help us then get to a, a diagnosis. And then of course, that's the last thing. Is, is it really just inflammation they're going uh, experiencing or is it infection? Is it just a chip tooth or is it a fractured tooth that's broken off at the gum line? So we can see a lot of these things and make it our our diagnosis. Then we can start recommending uh, some treatment options for the patients based on what we've seen. We can educate them about what's going on in their mouth, uh, what they can do in the moment to help relieve some of that pain and discomfort. And we can offer them reassurance, which is very important. You know, just sometimes just going to the doctor and finding out that you're going to live, <laughs> everything's going to be okay, is very important. So we can offer that to them as well. And then if antibiotics are indicated, we can prescribe those. If anti-inflammatories are indicated, we can prescribe those. So we can, any medications that are necessary. And the vast majority of these patients do require an in-clinic visit. And in that moment, we can go ahead and schedule that next visit for them. So next slide. Now we've talked a lot about barriers to, uh, to healthcare today. And if our patients cannot access, access preventive dental care or early treatment, we're gonna see a lot more emergent care. And we do see a lot of dental emergencies in community health centers because our patients just, they can't break those barriers of getting in for routine uh, care. So next slide. So this is what uh, teledentistry can do for us. Uh, it can eliminate some of those barriers. Uh, they can access care from their residence or their workplace. Um, some of our patients have to give 48 hours notice uh, to get transportation to our clinic. And so using uh, telehealth, they can access it the same day uh, rather than having to wait for that transportation. Uh, it's convenient. If you don't have childcare, you don't have to pile four kids in the car to, to come with you to your appointment. You don't have to drive a long distance if you're one, in one of our rural communities. Um, we can also decrease patient anxiety. That is one thing that prevents patients from coming to the dental clinics. And they can, they can talk to a dentist from, from their safe space at home, develop a relationship with that dentist. And when they do come into the clinic for the treatment, they've already had a conversation, they've already met the dentist, and they're much more accepting of treatment at that time. And then it also enables a dental provider to assess the patient, create a treatment plan, and do all those other important things more efficiently than with an office appointment. In order to have an office appointment, we need to have an open chair. And in a busy dental clinic, we oftentimes, every chair is filled. And if someone calls and says, you know, I'm in pain, we may have no place to put them, or they're gonna have to wait in the waiting room until we have that open chair. So we can actually, 
treat that patient uh, with a telehealth visit much more efficiently. And then this was very important, especially during, during the pandemic, but it still is very important now, it is it decreases the number of emergency department visits for oral pain. Uh, that way our emergency department uh, teams can be treating medical emergencies. And it also uh, decreases the cost of healthcare by you know, not having those expensive ED appointments for oral pain. Next slide. So uh, we had been using uh, telehealth uh, primarily for triaging for uh, toothaches, but there are so many other opportunities in dentistry to utilize telehealth. Uh, one is in our outreach programs. Uh, this is where we could use that asynchronous type of appointment, where if our hygienists are out of schools, nursing homes, daycare centers, with utilizing an intraoral camera, they can get images of what's going on in that patient's mouth. If they see something that looks suspicious to them, they can get some really high quality intraoral photos to be re reviewed by a dentist uh, at, at back at the clinic on another day. And then based on uh, the findings of the hygienist and then the findings of those photos, we can determine how best to treat the patient in the clinic. Um, we can use uh, telehealth for education as well. Uh, we can educate young new parents about oral health for their babies. We can talk about teething and, and thumb sucking and care for, you know, for the primary teeth. And we can do that all through, through telehealth. We can also uh, do some integrated care with the, with the medical department by uh, education and screenings for our pregnant patients and also for uh, diabetic patients. And then lastly, follow-up. Oftentimes after a difficult surgical procedure or a periodontal treatment, you wanna follow up with that patient just primarily to see how they're doing and how they're healing. Rather than having them drive all the way clinic for a very short visit and then drive all the way back, uh, we can do that follow-up uh, through telehealth and it's far more efficient for the patient uh, in that circumstance. So uh, next slide, please. So this is a pre-COVID photo of all the smiling faces of our dental department. And just wanna share that with you because we don't get to see smiles too often anymore. <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much. Next thank slide. Thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Riffle. You're welcome. Um, really appreciate those presentations from the health centers. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here just for a moment so we can move into a little bit more discussion. Um, a few of the themes that I picked on picked up on here today, um, a lot of workforce challenges being addressed by telehealth here, so stretching scarce provider resources and making sure that we're using them to the best of our abilities to increase on the amount of time that's actually spent with patients. Um, I really appreciated hearing the theme on the value of the audio only, both in terms of meeting um, internet barriers and patient um, resource barriers who don't, may not have access to the appropriate technology. Um, and then also, kind of meeting patients' needs who experience barriers, barriers accessing care. So as we noted in the beginning of the presentation, a lot of the patients seen in health centers are low income or Medicaid enrollees and really do face a lot of barriers, transportation, work schedules, and otherwise to accessing care in a, in a traditional format. Um, at this point, I would love to hear if we have questions from those on the phone and the way we can um, handle that, we'll kind of skip the panel discussion here to make sure we do get to questions today. I did see one from Heather Smith and Senator Teston's office, so we can address that one. But as others are thinking through what questions you have for our panelists, please go ahead and either drop your full question into the chat, which is great. Or if you'd like to voice your question, you're welcome to drop your name in the chat and we'll use it kind of like a cue. And uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and raise that question for the group. So um, I did see one here um, related to health information technology a little bit more broadly noting use of EHRs, WISHIN, which is a, um, a state's health information exchange, and telehealth as an important tool, but there are others as well. So I'll address that very, very briefly. I will note that we don't have our health information technology staff with us here today, but we do have clinicians. Um, I will note that we do work you know, closely with WISHIN and with um, other health information technology partners across the state on a variety of um, critical tools here. Um, all of our health centers do use EHRs and are advancing that work on a, on a regular basis. So Molly, I'm not sure if um, you'd care to add anything to this or if we'd just like to 
toss this particular question over to our health centers and then maybe follow up with Heather offline about this item as well. Looks like Dr. Pine has unmuted and um, is ready to address. So Dr. Pine, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, I think this came up in relation to the patient that I was talking about specifically. So um, yeah, I would say generally the, the more everyone is using um, various electronic uh, uh, means of uh, record keeping and following patients, the better for, for all of us. Um, we do see quite a few things like Medtronic coming through that helps us, um, again, facilitate um, visits with our chronic care patients in regards to their blood sugars and blood pressures, and it really um, gives us a lot more information. And so it is very helpful in that regard. With WISHIN specifically, um, the way our clinic uses it is more for alerts of patients that need outreach. Um, it's not very well integrated to all of our system. And so it's, it's difficult to be using on a, a patient to patient basis. But in the past year, it helped us helped alert us if um, patients tested positive for COVID so we could do that outreach, get them um, seen by telehealth or in person. We have a way to do that and help um, limit emergency room visits. Um, it also helps us uh, to uh, see if a patient is hospitalized so we can get that follow-up care done. Um, we do luckily have uh, some access to um, our neighboring hospital systems because again, the more we're able Able to see patients and take care of them, the more relief it is on emergency room visits and hospitalizations. And so we are able to look up if patients have been seen by specialists in the area, and that does absolutely help our visits. So we can often see what specialists have prescribed, but um, on a personal level, a lot of those visits look the same as our visits, that the patient goes and says, I got a um, new medicine from this doctor and but it's it's not clear whether they're taking it or not. And so that's really where we want to see the physical bottle so we can clarify if patients are actually taking medications or not. And so a specialist visit will say, I prescribed this, but I can't determine if the patient is taking it or not. And then it it sort of comes back to us to as primary care providers to really um um, drill down into what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis and reinforcing those. So um, while all of that is helpful, we do still need to have those interactions and, and, and get clarity from patients and their family members as to what is truly happening after they leave um, clinic visits. And so the main takeaway though, I would say is uh, the better integrated all of these things are, the much easier it is to actually um, take care of patients. And I think that that is a big area that needs to be worked on moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Pine. Um, and Heather, I will follow up with you a little bit more on that one too. So appreciate the question. I do see a question for Dr. Riffle, uh, sort of a tech question on your dental EHR. What dental EHR are you using? Are you charging for your dental telehealth service? And if so, are you being reimbursed? So Dr. Riffle, if you'd feel um, so inclined, would love to hear from you on that one. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we are using uh, the Epic Wisdom uh, electronic, electronic health record for our dental department. So we are fully integrated with our medical and behavioral health departments with our EHR. And yes, we were um, uh, reimbursed for our virtual visits. It was important that, be, uh, that we had that visual component though. So it was more of that functional equivalence so, uh, so that we didn't have any problem at all with any kind of reimbursement. Uh, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't give you the codes and everything, but I, we, I'd be more than happy to get that information to you uh, one of, through our billing department, but we were quite successful with that. Thank you, Dr. Riffle. And please do feel free to continue questions in the chat or drop your name, name in if you'd like to share a question for the group and unmute yourself. Um, I'll just tee up a few questions for folks as um, you continue to think through what you'd like to know. Um, I'm curious if a health center would care to kind of comment on where you see your telehealth practice moving. So we've heard a little bit about what you're doing today, but um, perhaps to tell us kind of where you expect to move in the future and what you're considering growing or changing along the way. Um, 
Dr. Riffle, maybe I think oral health is such a exciting place in the telehealth space. Would you care to start with that one? And I'll see if any other health centers would care to comment as well. Sure. And um, everything that was on my slide are things that I'm hoping we, <laughs> we, can, we can get to in the future. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it seems that in community health, you know, we, we oftentimes just try to make it through the day, <laughs> you know, with the influx of patients and, and taking care of everybody. And of course, now with the pandemic, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to get uh, support uh, staff. Uh, many uh, people are, are leaving health professions now. So there's that challenge as well. But I just think uh, the, uh, where, I can see this going first and foremost for us is in our outreach programs and having our hygienists. We're, we're about to get all new intraoral cameras and things for our clinic. And so having our hygienists armed with that and sending those images back to us, I'd like to see us getting more into nursing homes where we can provide a lot of preventive care and uh, we can diagnose uh, cavities utilizing the um, the intraoral camera, then we can prescribe something called silver diamide fluoride that we can apply to the cavities in the nursing home residents to help arrest their tooth decay. So there's just so many uses for this um, where you know we're so limited with what we can do within the clinic because we need to have the four walls and we need to have the equipment and we need to have that. Where if we can go out in the community with using telehealth, it's, it's almost limitless what we can do with it. Very exciting. Thank you. Oh, um, Sheila, please. Yes. Um, so from the substance use disorder, I would just echo um, some of the things that Dr. Riffle just said. Um, we do not see this, what do I want to say, as a, a kind of a separate tool. We see it part of the continuum of care and that outreach into the community is, is huge. So one of the things that we would be looking at, we have a, a major practice around uh, pregnant women who have substance use disorders. Well, I would like nothing better than that our first few visits after the delivery of that baby would be all telehealth. So we're not asking her to come out, travel uh, major distances with a newborn. Um, one of the things that, that people sometimes don't realize when you're talking about transportation and people covered by Medicaid, um, MTM is available, but up in the rural areas, it is no longer dependable. Uh, they are struggling to have workforce, uh, meet their workforce needs. So we have multiple people that everything is arranged and then the transportation cancels immediately in front of the appointment. So we have barriers that may not be perceived to be there, but really are. Um, likewise, if you have more than the newborn, the newborn can travel with the mother on MTM up to, I believe it's five weeks. If you have a two-year-old in the baby, two-year-old can't come unless two-year-old has an appointment. So there's all these layers that we see telehealth in its various uh, applications and varieties as just being an answer to a number of those things. Again, as part of the continuum of care, not in place of any one piece of it. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I think there may also be a, a misconception out there that some providers are not so jazzed about telehealth. And actually, um, the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association conducted a survey of clinicians in spring of last year to really understand um, provider perspectives on telehealth and perceived barriers that they see patients facing um, related to telehealth. And we'll share a link to that um, report with you all as um, part of the notes here today. But um, Dr. Valentine, I'm wondering if you could comment on that from 16th Street's perspective and share how providers are reacting to using this. And I know you talked a little bit about that, but tell us more, please. Yeah, so one of our roles is we supervise a number of the clinicians here at 16th Street. And so part of the integration of telehealth has included us getting feedback from our providers on the technology we're using and how it's working for them, what things aren't working for them. And um, you know, what they sort of like. And overwhelmingly for our clinic, it has been incredibly positive in terms of the experience of using and integrating telehealth to provide care. Both early on in the pandemic, when even providers are feeling uncertain about seeing, having in-person visits, it, it helped reassure their safety in terms of taking care of sick patients. Um, and then later on, as part of an integrated model to provide chronic care management, acute care sort of assessment, diagnoses, um, and then other sort of like ancillary services that we do provide, things like WIC and social services, and behavior health. I mean, it's been a boon for our patients 
Uh, we, you know, typically historically have had a no-show rate around the 10, 11 percent um, historically in years for patients coming to our clinic for scheduled appointments. Um, with the integration of telehealth, that number was cut in half, um, and it it worked great. And then earlier this spring, you know, I think when when it was uncertain if audio only components were going to continue to be covered, uh, we we opted to make a push to increase to in person more in person visits, and actually we saw our no-show rate increase again. And so again, it's sort of an access to care. It's also becoming that I think the new norm for patient expectations and that the ability to access care um, via telehealth is is something that feels very normal to them because it's available so broadly now and I think a lot of people are getting used to it and I think the withdrawal of that would be really detrimental at, you know I think a lot of ways to the patient experience um, but all of our clinicians really have had a great experience with it um, the biggest complaint has been the use of the, the ability of technology of the patients, right? And so it's often you're spending 10 minutes of, of, of your visit sort of triaging their internet. You know, you're talking to Nana who's like, uh, you have to hit the button, you know, like turn the camera the other way, that sort of stuff. But um, but other than that, I mean, you know, sometimes they're, it's been received really well. That's great to hear. Any other health centers care to comment on that item, experiences from providers? All right. Um, well, very good. With that, I will just share a few closing slides here um, to take us home in terms of the uh, policy priorities. I know you're seeing me scroll through my screen here. Pardon me. Um, I think what we're most excited about is just continuing to grow um, grow these models and learn and share with each other. So when WIPCA, you know, we talk with our community health centers and we're currently trying to help strategize with them of what does a permanent rollout of telehealth look like and how can that be sustainable for the future to meet patient needs. Um, a few of, and I know we've got some state lawmakers, federal staff on the line here, so I'm just going to run over a few policy items for you. Um, we're really closely engaged with Medicaid on developing permanent policy for the Badger Care coverage and have been excited that Medicaid is open to hearing the needs of health centers and patients. So really seeing that through the finish line with that audio only coverage as well. Um, for Medicare, we're supportive of a few federal bills and what both of these bills do, the Connect for Health Act and the Health Act are that they remove the barriers to um, patients accessing care from different locations and for care being provided from different locations. So Molly talked about that in the beginning, the originating in the distant site. So get rid of those requirements that someone has to be in a particular place to be accessing or providing care. Um, these Medicare bills also would um, largely support audio only components of telehealth policy and make sure that there's a sustainable way to fund the services provided through these methods. Um, we're also, as uh, Scenic Bluff noted, really working with commercial payers and hoping to see continued coverage options for telehealth, both through the end of the public health emergency, which is still active, as well as following the conclusion of the public health emergency. So hopefully today, we've all heard a little bit about the value and the need to continue these services. Um, and as we noted, those place restrictions need to be removed. It's been working well over the last year and a half, and we need that um, continued coverage. We talked about um, audio only as well as financial viability. And then one other component we'll just talk about briefly is um, to promote integration, the continuity of care, medical and behavioral need to kind of be treated um, together as a policy issue. So sometimes we see a policy issue for behavioral health services, but not for medical or something different. Um, but that can really create a lot of um, confusion and inefficiencies. Maybe you've got to pass someone off between a Zoom call and then a phone call. It really creates a lot of inconsistencies for sustainably growing and scaling these kind of programs. So whenever we can find more comprehensive and consistent policies, that's great for the integration of care as well. So as we move ahead, we're really just um, trying to make sure that providers can give services via telehealth without having to jump through any additional hoops, which is um, really, again, making telehealth part of traditional kind of new workflows. Everyone has talked about high-speed internet access here, whether that's in a rural area or even in an urban area. Um, and it's not just access, but affordability and the high-speed internet is really important here as well. 
we're working with health centers, as I noted, to strategize for what telehealth looks like moving forward. And we wanna make sure that providers and clinicians have the training they need to deliver telehealth. And then we wanna share information on what's working. So there's a lot about telehealth that's new and we wanna make sure that health centers and patients all have an opportunity to share their perspectives on best practices as they're developed and continuing to learn and grow together in this space. Um, and then I think innovation is such a kind of a broad word, but there is so much um, practice right now and so much learning happening. We wanna make sure that there are opportunities there. So with that, I'll just point you to a few resources. We have some new documents available that I'll send to you via email. We have a teledentistry brief and a telebehavioral health brief that outline um, excellent work that's happening at community health centers across the state. Um, my contact information is here. You'll get a follow-up email from me with this recording and slides. And then I would finally ask that you complete a brief survey for us. It has just been kindly dropped into the chat. That's just about five questions letting us know um, how we did today and what else you wanna know about. And hopefully you can consider this webinar a little bit of an appetizer if something piqued your interest and you wanna follow up for more, we can make those connections. Or if you're in a local area that wasn't represented by some of these health centers today, um, I'd be happy to chat with you and let you know what is happening in your local community. If you wanna learn more about telehealth, I may be right next door, something cool is happening, who knows. Um, so with that, I'll just ask um, Molly or Wipka folks, anything else to add today or any final words from our panel and presenters today? Okay, then I certainly want to appreciate um, policymakers, staff, um, and our partners who are on the line today. There's so much exciting work happening in the telehealth space and really want to appreciate the um, clinical leadership who came here today. Um, you can see folks um, are, some are in clinic today, some are in um, basements during tornado drill. So we really appreciate you taking time out of your day, seeing patients and sharing the value of telehealth. It's so important to kind of move us forward and make sure that we're all understanding the value of this um, exciting and um, emerging space for community health centers and patients. So thank you so much again, please do take that survey. You can click in the chat and find it right now and you'll see a follow-up email from me with additional details. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.